Hi everyone, it's Professor Pimson, and today we're going to talk about Taylor polynomials and Taylor's theorem. So in the previous video, we talked about a procedure for finding the Taylor polynomial of a given order for a function. In this video, we're going to talk about how to explain the meaning and significance of the Taylor's theorem with a remainder term, and also how to estimate the remainder term for a Taylor series approximation of a given function. So keep in mind, whenever we find Taylor series or Maclaurin series, a function f of x has a power series at x equals a, then it actually converges to the function f of x on some open interval containing the value x equals a. Then that power series is called the Taylor series for the function f of x at the value x equals a. This means that the Taylor series for a function at x equals a is unique. There's only going to be one Taylor series for a function f of x, as long as that Taylor series converges to that function f of x. However, to determine if a Taylor series converges, we're going to need to look at a sequence of partial sums. And these partial sums are actually finite polynomials, and they're called Taylor polynomials. So the definition of a Taylor polynomial, the nth partial sum of a Taylor series for a function f of x centered at x equals a, is known as the nth degree Taylor polynomial. So in other words, the zeroth, first, and second partial sums of the Taylor series are given as follows for the function f of x. So the zeroth partial sum, or the zeroth degree Taylor polynomial, is the function evaluated at x equals a. The first degree Taylor polynomial, t sub 1 of x, is the function f evaluated at a, so f of a, plus first derivative evaluated at a, so f prime of a, times x minus a to the first power divided by 1 factorial, or 1 factorial is 1, so it just doesn't show up. The second degree Taylor polynomial, t sub 2 of x, is f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus the second derivative of f evaluated at a divided by 2 factorial, which is 2, times x minus a in parentheses to the second power. In addition, whenever a is equal to 0, then the nth partial sum of the Maclaurin series for a function f of x is just simply called the nth degree Maclaurin polynomial. So for example, the exponential function f of x, which was equal to e to the x, has Taylor polynomials centered at a equals 0, for n equals 1, n equals 2, and n equals 3 are as follows. t sub 1 of x was equal to 1 plus x, t sub 2 of x is 1 plus x plus x squared divided by 2 factorial, and t sub 3 of x is 1 plus x plus x squared divided by 2 factorial plus x cubed divided by 3 factorial. Keep in mind that the Maclaurin series for the function f of x, which was equal to e to the x, was the series n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n divided by n factorial. So this is the first degree, second degree, and third degree Taylor polynomial for the function f of x equals e to the x. The graphs of the exponential function and these three Taylor polynomials are given in the following figure. Notice that as n goes to infinity, t sub n of x will actually approach the function e to the x. So the graph that's in pink is the function y equals e to the x, the natural exponential growth function, where the base is the number e and the variable is the exponent. T sub 1 of x is a linear function with a slope of 1 and the y-intercept of 1. So that's this straight line. It's y equals t sub 1 of x, or the function y equals 1 plus x. Notice that t sub 2 of x is actually a quadratic function. So t sub 2 of x is really 1 plus x plus 1 half times x squared. So that's this parabola. So it has a y-intercept of 1, and it will actually have a parabola that's opening up because it's 1 half x squared as its leading term. And notice that t sub 3 of x is the third degree Taylor polynomial. It actually is a cubic polynomial. It's 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared plus 1 sixth x to the third after you simplify the factorials. And so that's this graph that's in blue. You actually have the function y equals t sub 3 of x will actually be this cubic polynomial. So notice that the Taylor series for a function f of x, if the Taylor series converges to the function f of x, then the sequence of Taylor polynomials, t sub n of x, will actually converge to the function f of x as n approaches infinity. So whenever n approaches infinity, then the function f of x equals e to the x, the natural exponential function, can be approximated using t sub n of x because t sub n of x will actually converge to f of x as n approaches infinity. The Taylor polynomial actually will converge to the function e to the x as the number of terms increases towards Towards infinity, which will also mean that the power on the x will also increase towards infinity. And so it looks like as we increase the degree, we'll actually have more accurate approximations for the exponential function y equals e to the x. So let's talk about Taylor's theorem with a remainder term. If we define r sub n of x is equal to f of x subtract t sub n of x, so this is called the remainder term, r sub n of x is equal to the function originally, f of x, subtract the nth degree Taylor polynomial, t sub n of x, or equivalently, the function f of x 
is the remainder term r sub n of x plus the Taylor polynomial t sub n of x, where r sub n of x is called the remainder term of the Taylor series. If we can somehow show that the limit of your remainder term r sub n of x as n goes to infinity is equal to zero, then we have the following statement. The limit as n goes to infinity of the nth degree Taylor polynomial is the limit of your original function f of x. Subtract the remainder term r sub n of x is actually equal to, well, the limit of f of x is f of x as n goes to infinity. It does not involve n, so it's just the original function f of x. Subtract the limit as n goes to infinity of r sub n of x. If this limit is zero for the remainder term, then this limit as n goes to infinity of the nth degree Taylor polynomial is just the function f of x. So the theorem, Taylor's theorem with a remainder, let f of x be the function that can be differentiated n plus 1 times on an interval i containing the real number x equals a, let t sub n of x be the nth degree Taylor polynomial of the function f of x at x equals a, and let r sub n of x is equal to the function f of x, subtract the nth degree Taylor polynomial, t sub n of x. This r sub n of x is called the nth remainder term. Then for each x that's in the interval i, there exists a real number, x equals c, somewhere between a and x, such that the nth remainder term is equal to the n plus first derivative of f, evaluated at c, where c is between a and x, divided by n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the n plus 1 power. So notice that the r sub n of x is actually the n plus first term of your Taylor series. But instead of evaluated at x equals a, you'll be evaluated at x equals c, where c is somewhere between a and x on the interval. If there exists a number m where the absolute value of your n plus first derivative of the function evaluated at x is less than or equal to m, so if this absolute value of your n plus first derivative for any x value can be no larger than the number m for all x values on this interval i, then the absolute value of your remainder term, the nth remainder term, r sub n of x, is less than or equal to capital M, this number m, divided by n plus 1 factorial times the absolute value of x minus a raised to the n plus 1 power. So this is what's called Taylor's theorem with the remainder term. So what's important about Taylor's theorem is that it not only allows us to show that Taylor series converges to a function, but also allows us to estimate the accuracy of the Taylor polynomials in approximating the function at its function values. We're going to explore this concept in a later video. So in example two, we're going to talk about a convergence of a Taylor series. Show that the Maclaurin series, generated by the function f of x, which is equal to e to the x, the natural exponential function, converges to f of x for all real numbers. So we're already seeing that f of x equals e to the x, the nth derivative of the function is always e to the x for all n. That means that the derivative of e to the x is always e to the x for any derivative of e to the x. It will always be itself. And so that means if you evaluate the nth derivative of your function at zero, that means it will be e to the zero, which will be one. So in other words, the function will always be one if you evaluate the derivative of any order at the value x equals zero. Therefore, we actually have the nth degree Taylor polynomial as follows. t sub n of x is equal to f of zero plus f prime of zero divided by one factorial times x plus the second derivative evaluated at zero divided by two factorial times x squared plus the third derivative of your function f evaluated at zero divided by three factorial times x cubed and so on. You stop whenever you get to your nth derivative term. So it'll be plus dot 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 nth derivative of your function f evaluate at zero divided by n factorial times x to the n power. Well, we know that f of zero will be one, f prime of zero will be one, f double prime of zero will be one. They're all gonna be one for any derivative of your function evaluated at x equals zero. So t sub n of x will be one plus x plus x squared divided by two factorial plus x cubed divided by three factorial and so on up to x to the n divided by n factorial. So this is the nth degree Taylor polynomial. It's one plus x plus x squared over two factorial plus x cubed over three factorial plus dot 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 plus all the way up to x to the n divided by n factorial. Well, your original function was f of x. It was e to the x. That is the sum of your Taylor polynomial, your nth degree Taylor polynomial, t sub n of x, so it's this polynomial, plus a remainder term, r sub n of x. So now let's talk about the remainder term. So the remainder term, r sub n of x, using Taylor's theorem with a remainder, the last theorem we talked about, is the n plus first derivative of your function evaluated at c, divided by the parentheses n plus one factorial times x to the n plus one, where this x equals c is actually between a equals zero and also x. We're gonna show the limit as n goes to infinity of your nth remainder term is actually zero, because that will mean that the Maclaurin series for the function f of x, which is equal to e to the x, will actually converge for all values of x. 
So we have the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial times the function evaluated at c will be e to the c times x to the n plus 1. That is the absolute value of the nth remainder term, r sub n of x. So it's equal to the limit as n goes to infinity. We can drop the absolute value on n plus 1 factorial because it will be positive. e to the c is also positive because exponential functions are always above the x-axis. They're always greater than 0. So we have e to the c. That will be a positive number, so we don't have to have absolute value on it. But then we do have absolute value on x to the n plus 1. So remember a property about exponents. If you take the absolute value of x to the n plus 1, that's really absolute value of x and then raised to the n plus 1 exponent. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity of e to the c divided by n plus 1 factorial in the denominator times the absolute value of x raised to the n plus 1 power. Well, whenever n approaches infinity, that means we're going to have a very large value in the denominator. This expression will actually approach 0 as n approaches infinity. So that means that the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth remainder term, r sub n of x, is actually approaching 0. So that means that the limit as n goes to infinity without absolute value is also approaching 0. So r sub n of x as n goes to infinity, that limit is 0. And so that means that the Maclaurin series for the function f of x equals e to the x will actually converge to e to the x for all x values using Taylor's theorem with the remainder term. So example 3, we're going to find Taylor and Maclaurin series. For each of the following functions, find the Taylor series and its radius to convergence, then prove that the series converges to the function for all values of x in the interval of convergence. So number one, our function f of x is equal to negative 3 e to the 2x power, and we're going to have the power series centered at a equals 2. So this will be a Taylor series rather than a Maclaurin series because it's centered at a equals 2 rather than a equals 0. So let's start by finding out patterns for the coefficients using derivatives. f of x is equal to negative 3 e to the 2x. If you evaluate the function at a equals 2, you'll have f of 2 is equal to negative 3 times e to the 2 times 2 exponent. That'll be negative 3 e to the 4th power f prime of x is the derivative of this function f of x. You'll find out that f prime of x is equal to negative 3 e to the 2x times 2 using the chain rule because the derivative of e to the 2x is 2. So you have negative 3 e to the 2x times 2. And if you evaluate the derivative at 2, you'll have negative 3 times e to the 2 times 2 exponent times 2. That's really negative 3 times e to the 4th times 2 f double prime of x is equal to negative 3 times e to the 2x times 2 times 2. So again, you have the derivative of the exponent is 2, so you actually have another factor of 2. And so if you evaluate the second derivative at 2, you'll have negative 3 times e to the 2 times 2 exponent times 2 times 2. So that's negative 3 e to the 4th power times 2 squared. f triple prime of x will be negative 3 e to the 2x times 2 times 2 times 2. And whenever the third derivative is evaluated at 2, you'll have negative 3 times e to the 2 times 2 exponent times 2 times 2 times 2. That's really negative 3 times e to the 4th times 2 cubed. So it looks like we're forming a pattern. So if you want to find out a formula for the nth derivative of your function of x, it's really negative 3 e to the 2x times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. It's always just multiplied by 2. Your nth derivative evaluated at x equals 2 will be negative 3 e to the 2 times 2 exponent times all these 2. So it'll be 2 times 2 times 2 all the way up to 2. It's really negative 3 times e to the 4th. And now let's notice what the pattern is, how many 2's we actually have. Have. Our original function had 2 to the 0 power. Our first derivative had 2 to the first power. Second derivative had 2 squared. Third derivative had 2 cubed as a factor. That means our nth derivative will have 2 to the n as a factor. So our nth derivative evaluated at 2 will be negative 3 e to the fourth times 2 to the n. And so if our function f of x is negative 3 times e to the 2x, and we have the power series or Taylor series centered at a equals 2, the power series will be f of x is equal to the power series n equals 0 to infinity. It looks like they all have negative 3 as the coefficient. You have e to the fourth when you evaluate at x equals 2, and it also has 2 to the n. So you have negative 3 e to the fourth times 2 to the n for the nth derivative of the function f evaluated at x equals 2 divided by n factorial, that's part of the Taylor series, times, also part of the Taylor series, is x attract 2 in parentheses to the n, because it's x attract a, and a is equal to 2 in this case. So this is a Taylor series for the function f of x about a equals 2. So now let's find out what is the radius of convergence. The radius of convergence can be found by using the ratio test. So let's call L the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of the n plus first term divided by the nth term. So the limit as n approaches infinity of your n plus first term will be negative 3 times e to the fourth times 2 to the n plus 1 power times x minus 2 to the n plus 1 power divided by n plus 1 factorial divided by the nth term would be multiplication by the reciprocal of your nth term. It'll be n factorial in the numerator, divided by negative 3 e to the fourth in the denominator, 2 to the n also in the denominator, and then also x minus 2 to the n. 
also in the denominator. And so we need to simplify what's inside the absolute value to find out what is this limit. So the limit is n approaches infinity, absolute value. We have e to the fourth in the top and the bottom of the fraction. We also have a negative three in the top and the bottom. They'll all cancel out. But then we also have x minus two to the n plus one divided by x minus two to the n. That means you'll have an x minus two left over. You also have two to the n plus one divided by two to the n. That means you'll have a two left over. And then you also have n factorial divided by n plus one factorial. We know that n plus one factorial is really n plus one times n factorial. So the n factorials will cancel out and you also have n plus one left over. So it looks like it's a limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value two times x minus two all divided by n plus one. And so you take the absolute value of each of the factors. Absolute value of two will just be two. Absolute value of x minus two can be taken outside the limit. And then the absolute value of n plus one will be in the bottom of the fraction. And you can drop the absolute value because we know that n plus one is positive. So we have two times absolute value of x minus two times the limit as n approaches infinity, one divided by n plus one. Well, this limit is going to be zero. So it'll be two times absolute value of x minus two times zero, which is zero. And this value is the limit. So it's always going to be less than one. So by the ratio test, that means that the Taylor series or power series will always converge for all values of x. And so the Taylor series for the function f of x, which is equal to negative three times e to the two x, is this Taylor series and it converges for all x values because the radius of convergence is infinity. So number two, let's find out a Maclaurin series for the function g of x, which is equal to sine of the quantity pi times x divided by five. That's the argument of the sine function. And we want to find out a Maclaurin series because it's a equals zero. So recall that a Maclaurin series for the function f of x, which is equal to sine of x, was this that we found in the previous video. It's f of x is equal to sine of x is a Maclaurin series, n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n times x to the two n plus one divided by two n plus one in parentheses factorial. This was for the sine function. This power series converges to the sine function sine of x for all x values. And that means the rays of convergence is capital R is equal to infinity. If we want to find a Maclaurin series for the function g of x, which is equal to sine of pi x divided by five, it looks like we're replacing the x with a pi x divided by five. So let's replace x with pi x divided by five in the Maclaurin series to find out a Maclaurin series for the function g of x, which is equal to sine of pi x divided by five. So that means that g of x is equal to sine of pi x divided by five can be this Maclaurin series. Series from n equals zero to infinity, negative one to the n, we replace the x with pi x divided by five in parentheses, and that's raised to the two n plus one power divided by two n plus one in parentheses factorial. So now let's just simplify it a little bit. We have the series n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n. We have pi to the two n plus one power, x to the two n plus one power, and it's divided by five to the two n plus one power. So that will go in the denominator and it's divided by two n plus one in parentheses factorial. And so that's the series n equals zero to infinity, negative one to the n times pi to the two n plus one divided by the quantity five to the two n plus one times two n plus one in parentheses factorial times x to the two n plus one. That's a Maclaurin series for the function g of x, which was sine of pi x divided by five, and it's centered at a equals zero. So that's why it's called a Maclaurin series. So now we need to find out the, what is the radius convergence again. So let's use the ratio test. So the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of the n plus first term divided by the nth term is the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value Replace all the n's with an n plus one to find out your n plus first term. So that'll be negative one to the n plus one times pi to the two times n plus one plus one after you replace n with an n plus one. Do the same thing with x. It'll be x the two n plus one and then plus one outside the parentheses divided by five to the two times n plus one in parentheses and then plus one and then also factorial. You have two times n plus one plus one in parentheses and then factorial times the reciprocal of your nth term. So that would be five to the two n plus one times two n plus one in parentheses factorial divided by negative one to the n pi to the two n plus one times x to the two n plus one. That's in the denominator of the fraction. So we need to do a lot of simplifying inside the absolute value to find out what is the limit so we can actually understand what the ratio test tells us. We have the limit as n approaches infinity. We have negative one to the n divided by negative one to the n. They will cancel out. We'll have a negative one left over because it was negative one to the n plus one. We have pi to the two n plus one. We'll cancel out in the top and the bottom of the fraction and we'll have a pi squared left over. Same thing for x to the two n plus one divided by x to the two n plus one. They'll cancel out and you have an x squared left over. You have five to the two n plus one in the numerator. That'll cancel out with the one that's in the denominator and you have a five squared left over from the denominator. You have two n plus three factorial in the denominator. That's really two n plus three and then two n plus one factorial. So the two n plus one factorials will cancel out from the top and the bottom of the fraction. And so what's left over from the limit will be this. Limit as n approaches infinity, absolute value, you'll have a negative one left over, a pi squared, an x squared in the numerator. And then in the bottom of the fraction, you'll have a five squared and also a two n plus three in parentheses. 
So we need to find out what is this limit. So take the absolute value of each of the factors. Absolute value of negative 1 will just be 1. Absolute value of pi squared, well, that's positive. So you can just drop the absolute value and just be pi squared. Absolute value of x squared is really absolute value of x all squared divided by 5 squared. And then what would be left over would be limit of 1 divided by 2n plus 3. Because all the other factors do not involve n, they can be pulled outside the limit. Pi squared, absolute value of x all squared divided by 5 squared times a limit as n approaches infinity of 1 divided by 2n plus 3. This limit is 0 as n approaches infinity. And so this will be pi squared times the absolute value of x squared divided by 5 squared times 0, and that's 0. So the limit will always be less than 1 for all x values. So that means that the power series, or in other words, this Maclaurin series, will converge to the function g of x, which is sine of pi x divided by 5, for all x values. So the rate of convergence is infinity because the limit is always less than 1 for all x values. So let's try a couple more. Number three, the function h of x is equal to sine of x, but this time it's actually centered at a equals pi divided by three. So we can't use the Maclaurin series for the function h of x, which is equal to sine of x, because we're not centered at a equals zero, we're centered at a equals pi over three. So this means we need to actually calculate what are the coefficients using the derivatives of the function h of x. So h of x is sine of x, that would be evaluated at pi over three. So h of pi over three will be sine of pi over three, that's squared three divided by two. The first derivative of h of x is the cosine function because that's the derivative of sine of x. So it's cosine of x. If you evaluate cosine of x at pi over 3, you actually get 1 half. So h prime of pi over 3 will be 1 half. The second derivative of h of x is negative sine of x because that's the derivative of cosine of x. And if you evaluate the second derivative at pi over 3, you'll get negative sine of pi over 3. That's the opposite of square root 3 divided by 2. The third derivative of h of x is the derivative of negative sine of x, that's negative cosine of x. And so the third derivative evaluated at pi over 3 will be the opposite of cosine of pi over 3, which is equal to negative 1 half. And then the fourth derivative of h of x is equal to sine of x again. And so the fourth derivative evaluated at pi over 3 will be sine of pi over 3, which is again square root 3 divided by 2. So notice in these first five calculations, there's not a consistent formula for the function values. We need to actually have two different series involved because one of them is involving square root 3 divided by 2 and negative square root 3 divided by 2. And the other series will involve 1 half and negative 1 half because the coefficients are going to be alternating between square root 3 divided by 2 and also 1 half. And so that means we need two series depending on whether there are an even or an odd number of derivatives that will actually have been taken for the function h of x. So notice you have h of x is equal to h evaluated at pi over 3 plus h prime evaluated at pi over 3 divided by 1 factorial times the quantity x subtract pi over 3 plus the second derivative of h evaluated at pi over 3 divided by 2 factorial times x minus pi over 3 in parentheses all squared plus the third derivative evaluated at pi over 3 divided by 3 factorial times x minus pi over 3 in parentheses to the third power and so on. If you replace all the function values, h of pi over 3 was square root 3 divided by 2, so you have square root 3 divided by 2 for the first term, plus the second term would be h prime of pi over 3, that's 1 half, so you have 1 half divided by 1 factorial times the quantity x minus pi over 3 to the first power. The second derivative evaluated at pi over 3 was negative square root 3 divided by 2, so you have negative square root 3 divided by 2, and you also have a 2 factorial in the bottom of the fraction times x minus pi over 3 all squared. The third derivative evaluated at pi over 3 was negative 1 half, so you have negative 1 half and you also have a 3 factorial in the bottom of the fraction times x minus pi over 3 all cubed. And so it looks like there are two different series that we need. We have h of x can be this power series, n equals 0 to infinity. It looks like if you have square root 3 divided by 2 and it alternates signs, so you have negative square root 3 divided by 2. The next will be positive square root 3 divided by 2. So it looks like you have a negative 1 to the n because it needs to alternate signs. You have a square root 3 divided by 2 with all those coefficients divided by 2n factorial, because this is the zero term or the original function. You also have square root 3 divided by 2 when you had an even power on the x. It will also occur when you have degree 4. So you have 2n in parentheses factorial times x minus pi over 3 to the 2n power, plus all the other terms are a power series involving the coefficient 1 half. So plus the series n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n, because 1 half is also alternating signs. It went from 1 half to negative 1 half, It'll go back to 1 half and they'll alternate back to negative 1 half and so on. So you have negative 1 to the n to alternate signs. 1 half is the coefficient for all those derivatives. And all those derivatives involved odd powers of x. So you have first derivative was 1 half. 
third derivative was negative one half, the fifth derivative will be positive one half, and so on. You also have two n plus one in parentheses factorial because you're dealing with odd powers, x minus pi over three, also to the two n plus one power. So this is a Taylor series. These two different power series added together gives you a Taylor series for the function h of x, which was sine of x, where it's centered at a equals pi over three. And notice that the radius of convergence for the sine function was infinity. So capital R is infinity, since the radius of convergence is R equals infinity for the sine function, f of x equals sine of x, where a is equal to zero. Or you can use the ratio test again if you want to find out that the limit is actually zero, which is less than one for all x values. So the radius of convergence is infinity. So let's finish up this video with the number four. Number four, we're going to find out a Taylor series or Maclaurin series for the function k of x, which is equal to x times cosine of x, where it's centered at a equals zero. So this time it will be a Maclaurin series. So recall that a Maclaurin series for the function f of x, which is equal to cosine of x, was actually this. f of x is equal to cosine of x. It was the power series n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n times x to the two n exponent, all divided by two n in parentheses factorial. Therefore, if you want to find a Maclaurin series, because this is actually centered at a equals zero, we can find a Maclaurin series for this function k of x. The function k of x is actually x times cosine of x. So if you take this power series for the cosine function and you actually multiply by x, you can actually find a power series for the function x times cosine of x. So k of x will actually be x times the power series for cosine because we know that this power series or Maclaurin series actually converges to the cosine function for all x values. So we'll have k of x is equal to x times this power series n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n times x to the two n exponent divided by in parentheses two n factorial. And if you multiply through this x to each of the terms in the series, you actually have the series n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n times x to the two n plus one, because you're multiplying x to the two n times x, that'll actually make it x to the two n plus one exponent. And the denominator would just be two n in parentheses factorial. So let's find out what is the radius of convergence for this power series that actually will converge to k of x. What x values will actually converge to k of x, which is x times cosine of x. So let's use a ratio test again. So we have the limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of the n plus first term divided by the nth term. Well, the n plus first term would be negative one to the n plus one times x to the two times n plus one after you replace the n with n plus one and then plus one also in the exponent divided by two times the quantity n plus one and then that's all factorial times the reciprocal of your nth term which would be two n factorial in the numerator and then in the bottom of the fraction, you'll have negative one to the n times x to the two n plus one. Now again, we need to simplify what's inside the absolute value to find out what is the limit. So the limit as n approaches infinity of negative one to the n plus one will be negative one times negative one to the n times x to the two times n plus one in parentheses plus one. That'll be x to the two n plus three. That's really x to the two n plus one times x squared. And then you have two n in parentheses factorial in the numerator. So in the denominator, you'll have two n plus two factorial, and then you also have negative one to the n, and also x to the two n plus one. So after you simplify anything that's in common in the numerator and denominator, you'll have a limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value. You have a negative one left over. You have an x squared left over, and then you have a two n plus two factorial in the bottom of the fraction. You have a two n factorial in the top of the fraction. You actually have a two n plus two left over after you cancel out two n factorial from the top and the bottom. So the absolute value of negative one is one. The absolute value of x squared becomes absolute value of x squared times the limit of what's left over that involves n. It'll be limit as n approaches infinity of one divided by two n plus two. Well, this limit is zero. And so you have zero times the absolute value of x squared at zero. And so the limit is always zero for all x values. So the limit's less than one for all x values. So by the ratio test, that tells us that the power series, or in this case, Maclaurin series, actually converges for all x values. So that means the rate of convergence is infinity. So this finishes our video on Taylor polynomials and Taylor's theorem. We explained the meaning and significance of Taylor's theorem with a remainder term, and we also talked about how to estimate the remainder term for a Taylor series approximation of a given function. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions about your work on the homework for this section, please let me know as well. And I'll see you in the next video when we talk about the binomial series.